Hi. We're just getting another stream going. Um, so this is actually going to be a bit different than my usual stuff. Um, my usual streams tend to be sort of rambling technical explorations that eventually lead to some progress on a thing that I've been building for a while and eventually some video about that thing. Um, and this is going to be a bit more of a let's play because I've done... So we've had, we've had a few work streams on this and then um, I've also done a bunch of work on this off camera recently just because I got carried away and didn't really have the energy to stream but did uh, want to make some progress on this. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. So yeah, we're going to actually uh, do more of a let's play. Um, so here's my cat. Um, I will briefly talk about the code behind what you're going to see, but we're going to mostly go through the game. So this is a classic game. Um, it's an adventure game about digital logic, which is sort of an interesting concept on its own. Um, sorry about the shaking here. Um, yeah, so it's an adventure game about digital logic, which um, might be familiar if you've heard of some other related games like Rocky's Boots or Gertrude's Secrets, which were both from the 80s. Um, there have also been a few more recent games that kind of touch on this um, kind of logic or steering around robots or programming um, computers to do something. Like, you know, there, there have been a bunch of cool games like that. Um, I think the Zaktronics games uh, a lot of you might be familiar with. Um, so this is maybe along some of the, some of the, uh, you know, some of those same lines. Um, it's kind of an infamous, infamously difficult and strange game in some ways. Um, so yeah, Robot Odyssey. It's from the mid '80s, and I've been working on this port um, to bring it to the web using WebAssembly, and just generally make it a little bit nicer to use on modern computers. Um, and so we've been just making a lot of progress um, toward that lately. But um, a couple of pretty big changes just this week. Um, one of those changes is that you can now get this automatic autosave. I guess that's what autosave means. So it autosaves into the URL bar now. And the other, as you're seeing now, is uh, mouse support. So the character will follow around your mouse. You can still use the keyboard or the simulated joystick. So. You can also use the joystick, which still works better than the simulated mouse on mobile sometimes. Um, and then there's also real keyboard or virtual keyboard. So you can click the little on-screen keyboard buttons for the full steps or partial steps, you know, big steps or little steps. Um, or press the arrow keys for big steps or shift arrow keys for little steps. Same as the original keys. Um, although those keys don't work in like DOS box or like pretty. This game is not really great with emulators usually, so um, I'm trying to match the original experience but then make it nicer when I can. So adding mouse support, not having to swap floppy disks, better save game support basically. Um, and just to be clear, I'm not adding new save game functionality, so I'm still letting you save exactly where the original game would have let you save, and the data that's being saved is the same as what the original data is. I'm just um, automating the process of taking the saves. So when I move around, you'll notice if I leave it for a second, the URL changes. <clears throat> and in fact, if I were to use the back button, I could actually access some of those previous states if I wanted to. Um, I'm not quite sure how much I want to pollute the URL history, but at this point, I'm actually just really happy to have such a nice sort of undo functionality, so it seems all right. Um, yeah, and I, I was sort of agonizing over how to make these saved games easy to share. Um, and the two solutions I, I was sort of trying to, 
trying to gravitate toward was either using a specially formatted image so that you could send like a screenshot that had some extra like metadata bits or some like encoded pixels or something. So you could send that to your friends. Um, given that I want that to survive Twitter and that the easiest way to do that seems to be a PNG with transparent regions, um, that's one thing to try. But I was also noticing that you can store about four kilobytes of data inside Twitter's URL shortener in the form of your URL. So um, the save game data is usually bigger than that. It's, um, it's actually fixed size, about 25 kilobytes. But um, I, I managed to, after a bunch of experimentation, get it to consistently compress down to just several hundreds of bytes. So, um, using Chrome on my other computer and I remember the hotkey for, uh, for the console in there better than I do here. Yeah, so this is actually still telling you how big the autosaves are. Um, and they will get bigger as you, um, as the game state gets more complex and theoretically I think you could get this to be probably like 28 kilobytes or so. But um, there's two things that are uh, two things behind this uh, being so tiny. One is that I'm using a compression algorithm that's pretty well suited to this data and it's just pretty modern in general. Um, and this came from a tip uh, from uh, someone on Twitter, I think, uh, Benjamin, if I remember remembering right. So yeah, thanks a lot for, um, for pointing me toward this library. It's called Z standard or ZSTD. Um, it's one side effect of the whole Facebook industrial complex. So we've got this uh, open source um, library that's actually similar to Zlib um, in that it, um, it has layers of compression. It has a dictionary kind of back reference style compression, um, what you usually see uh, called LZ77. And that works by looking for repeated sections of data and matching it up to something you've previously decompressed. Um, and so one thing that makes these save files kind of large by default is that when you just open a new world with nothing in it, it's actually got a copy of a bunch of the games on disk data files. Um, and most of those never get modified. Um, in fact, the, uh, quite a lot of them are, are just static. Um, and so unless you had some kind of world editor or something strange, you know, there might be edge cases where things do get modified. And I didn't want to necessarily have to rule all of those out. And I'd rather just store the entire actual saved game fi uh, file, like as it would have written to a floppy disk. Um, this idea of automatically identifying, um, you know, kind of common sub saved files that exist you know, both in other parts of the save file and in those on disk files just seems like a nice generic solution to that. So I'd actually started down the route of trying to figure out how to, um, how to kind of, you know, with a, lot, with a lot of knowledge of how the save files are actually stored and loaded, go figure out how to ex like remove most of the like unchanging static data and like zero that out and then restore it. Um, and I'd went pretty far down that path um, with like coming up with a reference save file for a particular world and like XORing it in and then gzipping that. Um, so yeah, this idea of just using a nice like um, sort of preloaded dictionary buffer so that that sort of LZ77 part of the compression codec, when it's looking for back references before it's got the whole like buffer full of stuff that's already been decompressed, it has the buffer full of stuff that I've planted there, which was pre-distributed or in this case, um, what this does is on startup, every time you start the game, it actually takes those game data files that we know are going to be present in the save data and concatenates them and trims them in this well-known way and generates this blob of data, which then becomes the compression dictionary. Um, so that has to be the same every time, or when you decompress it, you'll get a different save file and it'll be corrupted. Um, so yeah. Um, this, uh, this gets the save file pretty small by using a pre-shared dictionary that generated from the save data. Um, and then the codec, as I was mentioning, Z standard is a lot like Zlib. 
um, which works with a few layers, but the most important layer is this kind of dictionary back reference layer. Um, it's also got layers that take those dictionary references and anything else and pack them into the smallest number of bits possible by analyzing how frequently those different symbols occur. You might see that called Huffman encoding, which is the original algorithm that that's all based on. Um, <clears throat> and so Zlib and ZStandard both have a Huffman layer, but I think um, I tried a lot of this with different compression algorithms. So um, LZ77, or sorry, um, I tried using LZMA, which is the algorithm that 7-zip uses by default, um, and it's known for having very good compression ratios. And it actually did give me really nice ratios, even without the pre-shared dictionary, but it was extremely slow to the point of like blocking the CPU for a quarter second every time I did an autosave and using 30 megabytes of memory. So I needed something less intense than LZMA, but still, um, if I use plain old um, uh, like Zlib or Deflate, same thing, um, that codec actually, the back references can't quite be long enough to be useful. I need them to be like a few kilobytes. And um, I think the references are on the order of a couple hundred bytes at longest with Zlib. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I, I remember reading the source code for that to actually check and just based from memory, that's like the order of what they were. And so it worked, but even after compression, I ended up with a lot of repeated references just because Zlib couldn't quite reach far enough or be long enough, or be long enough rather. Reaching far enough is a different problem, and that affects the largest dictionary you can use. Um, and so the dictionary I would like to use is also a little bit bigger than what I can fit in Zlib, but I, was, I have a workaround for that if, I, if that was the only problem, but there were other problems. Sorry that got rambly. Anyway, that's how the autosaves work. Um, so if you just take this URL, um, so if I, you know, I can like do stuff in the game, like, um, you know, I can start putting gates around and making a circuit, which is a lot faster with the mouse input. Um, and let's say I wanted to pick this up in another web browser, except, is that still auto-saving? Yeah. So I would just go up here and grab this URL, and let's try testing it in Safari then. So here I am, and there's the circuit right as I left it in that robot. So that's that's how it's supposed to work. Um, I'm still I'm not quite sure I like how the mouse just always follows you around. Like, um, it might be nice to have some kind of gesture to cause the player to come toward you, um, but I don't know. Or maybe a mode where, you know, if you've clicked since moving into the frame, it's tracking you, otherwise it isn't. I think I might implement something like that. Yeah, I guess uh, I guess Dean's pointing out that a lot of people do just call these Zachtronic style games. But yeah, I thought that was a funny label because this was my introduction to these style games. It was like, oh, it's like a it's like a learning company style game from the eighties. I remember those. So yeah, um, I talked about the autosaves. The other major feature here is mouse support. Um, there's also just generally a slightly nicer input and input queuing system. So that, for example, if I went to the innovation lab here, um, and I go over here, there's a whole system for making your own chips in this game. So you can put a chip in there, and you can put a blank chip in this thing, and you can go inside the chip. Oh my gosh, this is so much faster with the mouse. Let's say I just wanted to make a chip that's just like a giant flip-flop for some reason. Maybe with a with like an XOR gate down here. I don't know. So as I'm wiring it, the chip's inputs and outputs change. Um, all right, and now I can go over here and burn the chip. Oh, I feel like I can't help but also be paranoid for like slight pixel accuracy errors here because I was just earlier today working on the code that makes sure that. You know, the, the soldering iron tip actually lines up with your, your mouse when you stop, right? And that's actually, as you can imagine, a little bit tricky. Um, but I think it's working.
can burn a chip. Um, there's also a little documentation editor now. And now that there's like a non-zero amount of keyboard queuing, you can type and it actually keeps up. Oh, geez, I'm gonna have to remember what pin was which, aren't I? Um, I think also with stuff like this where it's kind of obvious that this documentation editor could be better, um, but I don't wanna, like I also kind of like the original experience, you know? There's stuff like the floppy disk menus, like I don't think anybody is really gonna miss the press enter after inserting your storage disk kind of stuff. But um, the original datasheet editor, I think, is kind of nostalgic enough that I wouldn't want to break this. But uh, and in fact, I've already gone to a lot of trouble to make sure that this still works. Um, oh, some of the keyboard mapping is slightly wrong. Apparently, that's quote. Uh, there are some weird characters available. Oh, that's how you get the bullet. OK, I haven't completely explored this font yet. That's cool. Um, yeah, so you can type stuff. Normally you would write something like, that would be the flip-flop output. Except, um, oh yeah, control C clears the whole thing as the help indicates. I don't know how to clear just a single, I don't think I have the forward delete working yet. So yeah, you know, you can you can just like document this as much as you feel like. You can also, while you're holding the chip, you can press S and that will actually save it to disk or crash. Why did it crash? Usually that saves it to disk. All right, well, that's something to debug. Yeah, it still crashes. I don't know why that does. I'll have to debug that later. I don't feel like debugging it now. Um, yeah, so keyboard queuing. Um, and then the mouse also, I gave it a, a short queue. So basically you can click and move stuff around. Um, this would make a little more sense if I actually had a circuit. Let's get a fresh lab. Oh, Tuco's on the rack. Let's get Tuco on the camera. Oh, ha, ha, ha. James is like, I wonder if Zach was even alive. Yeah, I mean, I, this was game, this game was made like around the year I was born. All right, let's get a fresh lab. Um, I'm also gonna. It's making me nervous doing cross browser testing here. Let's open up Chrome um, and get something slightly more familiar. I've been trying to do a lot of cross-browser testing, but admittedly I have been doing a lot of my work in Chrome because I just like its debugging tools. Um, mostly from familiarity. All the browsers have been getting quite nice developer experiences lately. All right, so you can use this in different shapes too. Um, you know, you can make it pretty small and tall. Um, this is kind of nice for mobile. Um, on desktop, I find I don't need the on-screen keyboard much because you can use the real keyboard, but sometimes I'll scroll down here and grab some of the keys, like the speed control. All of this is very temporary. As you can see, it's a work in progress. Um, but um, And then you can make the joystick go away, but the joystick is kind of handy sometimes. So, yeah, I'll get a fresh lab and... So yeah, like if I wanted to start building something, it would be pretty easy to get ahead of it here because, um, so what's going on here is as you move the mouse, I've got a control loop in the code that I've added to the game, which uh, it doesn't modify the positions of anything because it's really way too easy to cheat like that. I wanted to be sure that I was respecting all the game's existing collision detection and uh, like enemy and positioning rules. So I didn't want to be moving any objects directly in a non-cheating mode of gameplay, 
but I figure it's fine to inspect the location of the player. So I'm looking at where the player is and then generating joystick input um, every time the game po pulls the joystick. And then I've got a little proportional control loop that I've tuned in there to just try to keep up. Um, and so as you move, you can see it sort of moves fast and then it like slows down and then should settle exactly on the location. So then adding to that, um, there's a little bit of input queuing so that you can, for example, get a little bit ahead of it. And, oh, why is that not working? Oh, right, because there are two inputs. It would help if I paid attention to the circuit. Um, oh, see, right there, the thing that I just did was I expected the soldering iron switch over and the mouse to be in the same queue. And so I clicked the thing and then I pressed S and then I soldered the thing, but they're actually in different queues, so that didn't work. Maybe they should be in the same queue. Um, so yeah, it has a queue where um, clicks have to last at least one frame and a move. Um, so for example, right now, I'm kind of staying ahead of it and it's chasing me because there's nothing else in the queue. But if I clicked and then moved over there, then you see it, it actually dropped it off and then came and found me because there was a click event in the queue ahead of me. So, so far I've found that to be pretty intuitive. Um, and it seems all right, but you know, it might need some tweaking in the future. And if you're just in the lab and you're building a circuit like this, you can always just turn up the speed and then, uh, then the game will keep up just fine. And then you can just make stuff without really having to wait for it as much. I was also experimenting with a mode where it automatically speeds up when there are queued input events. And it actually does this for keyboard events right now because I found that to be useful. Um, but it just felt weird for mouse events. Like I tried different speed up ratios and it just mostly felt weird to just have every animation and all the circuits and stuff in the game speed up when you move the mouse and then slow down when the mouse isn't moving. It feels like a broken emulation or broken power management or something. So it seems like it would be better just to have accessible speed controls. So it's easy to just move stuff around like this. So yeah, I just, so I just made a huge mess. Um, anyway, um, and you could bring this over to the chip burner and burn it onto a chip. And I've still got it in fast mode right now. But anyway, I think you get the idea. And I think I've talked about the stuff enough. Um, I want to give you a very quick tour of the source code just so that you know like what's behind this and how to find more about it. But then I just want to play it for a while, all right? <laughs> uh, make this more of a, a let's play. All right. So the code is up here at Robot Odyssey Rewired on my GitHub. Um, this does not include the original game. Um, for this to compile, you have to drop a copy of the original game in this directory. But then this has a bunch of scripts that will disassemble it and generate C++ code, and then combine that with more C++ code, and uh, mscript and all of that into a WebAssembly. <laughs> so uh, the source code here is actually a pretty interesting mix of Python, JavaScript, and C++. Um, so for example, if you go to input, uh, there's some C++ code for input. So there's the input buffer. There's some joystick polling. You can maybe, maybe the header is a better starting place. So this is the C++ class for the input buffer. Um, and so on the input side of the input buffer, you know, this has a bunch of things you can do that are sort of higher level emulated things. So you can press a key, you can move the joystick directly, but you can also update the state of the emulated mouse. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then that whole object is actually just used in this um, kind of hardware encapsulation. And this is this is maybe not still the best name for it, but this thing that it's calling hardware is just sort of from the 
original game's perspective, this is all stuff that would be taking place that would be taking place in the BIOS or the operating system or the physical chipset. Just something that's kind of outside of the application's um, memory or control flow, really. So this also includes the emulated memory, which is 256 kilobytes. Yeah. Um, that tiny save file packer. So for example, um, the way that autosave works, okay, main. This is actually a decent starting point, main.js. So well, the actual starting point is here is maybe index.html, but this just has kind of the work in progress UI with the buttons and that kind of stuff. Um, important elements here, there's a canvas, there's some indicators for loading and errors. Um, there's a loader for this whole bundle that's generated by Webpack and has all of our JavaScript and the loader for the WebAssembly and a few libraries that we're using from NPM. Um, and then main.js is what actually gets this stuff running. So we're importing all the other modules that we need and then Loading errors either happen synchronously in this try-catch block, or they happen asynchronously. Um, either way, they, the uh, status indications need to make their way over this loading module. And then, um, let's see, input, um, input events all would get set up over here. And, you know, there's, there are a lot of different paths to go through, and I certainly don't want to go through all of them, but, like, for example, um, if you were to click, then you get a mouse down, and that calls engine.setMouse button, which then, that actually goes directly through mscripten's bindings to engine.cpp um, via this linkage down here, so, I like, set mouse button in this function table. This is this sort of pseudo function that, um, I think this actually does turn into code at runtime, that at initialization time sends objects over to the JavaScript side that establish these bindings um, based on a lower level system call mechanism. Uh, but then after that setup from the JavaScript side, you can call this function and that eventually makes its way to, uh, this, this also has a little add-on that skips um, queued animations, like cutscenes, for example. But for the most part, this would go to the input layer that we were just seeing, the header file, set mouse button. And then, so set mouse button in the input module. And then that actually pushes um, one of these mouse event data structures into a queue. This is a circular buffer. And then later in this pull joystick function, um, we end up calling update mouse, which will take that event out of the queue and process it and handle updating the emulated joystick location, which then gets returned to the caller of pull joystick um, via these output parameters. Um, so that's where things start to get a little bit more complicated. And then pull joystick itself is called by a piece of code that we're actually inserting into the original game in one of these Python scripts. So that's this patch joystick function, um, which we call on any of the game binaries that include joystick support, which is pretty much all of them. Um, we're actually looking for this piece of machine code that would be po pulling the low-level joystick and replacing it with some C code that calls into this uh, pull joystick and um, puts the results in these registers and this memory location. So that's how the input works. Isn't it great? <laughs> um, I did just completely skip over how the actual mouse emulation works, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, so in update mouse down here, um, we're looking for events and basically processing whatever's at the front of the queue and then moving on as soon as we can clear that, from, that event from the queue. So I think I mentioned that button events just last for one frame and then they move on, but a position event will actually try to move the cursor to that position before the event gets popped off the queue. 
That's where this virtual mouse to position function comes in. We keep calling that until it returns true, and then we remove the corresponding event. So this is where I had to play with these parameters to try to figure out what would give me good motion. There's actually a pretty significant dead zone that I have to skip over in the game's existing joystick emulation. And if I don't, then you can just end up kind of stuck, not quite making it to the right location. Um, if the speed is too high, then you end up with integer wraparound in the game. So I'm just like conditioning the parameters here. But um, this is getting the player position using this interface RO world, um, which is this other C++ object that you can use to query data directly from the memory in the game. And that's all based on reverse engineering, how the game's data structures work. So we're getting the player location. Um, this is a proportional control loop. And then this is just compensating for the minimum and maximum speed. And um, this is also a little bit stateful so that we also remove items from the queue if the player is stuck against something and not making progress. So, um, and then that RO world thing is kind of interesting. That's all based on these data structures in here. So you can see here, this is where it starts to get interesting. Like these are actually da data from the game. So like object IDs for the player, for the, all the robots, for the parts of the robots, um, crystals, antennae, not gates, thrusters, different worlds. And then these data structures match the game's in-memory layout. And then you can call, for example, yeah, so here's our world. You can call from process. And then given uh, this process, which is a way of accessing the game's like memory and registers, basically. Um, then you can get a pointer to this RO world, which it turns out is just in the emulated data segment of the game. And then you can just read out stuff like, um, oh, where's something good? Oh, this doesn't have the world ID in it. Um, there's some additional data that's in the save file that I keep getting used to seeing. Um, the formats for the save file, the in-memory data, the on-disk data, they're all interrelated, but not quite exactly the same. So this, this took a little bit of um, attention to detail. You can figure out these mappings pretty easily, though, just by adding some printfs around the emulated file system reads and writes and noticing where the data on disk ends up in, rem in memory by looking at the pointers. I'm going to just load up on coffee and tea, and I think I might have enough. All right, and this there's a lot more to do with the debugging here. I'm already feeling like it would be really great to have an add-on that shows you information about the object you're holding. Um, and even just like right now, do I know if I know if I'm holding an object or not? Um, like that would take some reverse engineering. Um, that would even be useful for the touch control so that I could maybe um, Right now, if you're dragging on the on the touchscreen, it would be nice to know that uh, you're actually holding an object, and then when the drag ends, I could send another click to release the uh, you know to release the object in game, so that then like dragging acts a lot more naturally, stuff like that. It's already sort of usable on an iPad, but it needs work. It's the best experience right now is with a mouse and a keyboard, I think. And the most authentic experience would be just a keyboard because the mouse is completely inauthentic. Uh, I mean, it's not cheating because it's just generating joystick events, but it will be a lot more pleasant on your fingers, I think, than just hammering on the arrow keys. So anyway, that's, that's plenty of talking about the code. I've already scared away people who just want to see the game, sorry. <laughs> um, all right, well, we could start with the tutorials, um, but I've already been through the tutorials on a previous stream, and I think I can probably just talk about how the game works. And some of this, obviously, um, you know, it could talk about how to move around with the keyboard, but I'm not necessarily going to want to move around with the keyboard if I can use the mouse. 
Um, although stuff like this is useful, like S, soldering iron, T, toolbox. Um, turn it off and summon it anytime. Um, yeah, normally you go inside the robot by holding shift and moving really slowly and then walking inside the robot. Um, you can do the same thing with the mouse. It's a little disorienting right now because it still keeps trying to servo the cursor to your mouse location. Um, I'm going to solve some of these problems by adding new, new in-game hooks so that when the game warps you to a different screen or when an in-game enemy moves you or something like that, then I cancel mouse events so that things like that aren't disorienting still. You can just click to trigger the thruster switch, for example, which is nice. So yeah, just like, um, so like with the keyboard, you would move around and then just press space to grab, press space to ungrab. That's the original. Um, with the mouse, clicking is the same as pressing space. So you click once to grab, click once to ungrab. So that's why I'm thinking like it'd be nice if dragging was a little more intuitive. Because right now it's like you never let go of the joystick button. And then you let go of the joystick button and you're actually still holding it. So, I don't know, just small things I'd like to improve. So now it's saying I can do carry scanner. So yeah, you can go inside the robot and see outside. Oh, let's turn off scanner. Let's, let's take this off apart. Um, so it's talking about this eye that you can sit on. So with the keyboard, you can just walk on the eye and see out. Works exactly the same way with the mouse now. You can just sit on the eye. When you're in this view, the character sprite is still right there where the mouse is. So if you move that, you move off the eye. You can put objects inside robots. I can leave scanner here. Here's Sparky. Yeah, and then there's remote control. Turns the robots on and off. Anyway, I, I said I'm not going to go through all the tutorials, but you can see how um, I've tried to keep this such that the original controls work, but the new controls are kind of sensible. Um, anytime it talks about the joystick, that's this little circle here. If you move this, it's the emulated joystick and the emulated joystick button. So, let's start a new game. It's like you had this dream about being taken by the robots and then you wake up and oh no, you're taken by the robots. That cutscene is supposed to sound a little less terrible. My emulation of that sound is not quite spot on. It's on the to-do list for sure. All right, so now I can wander over here. And the first thing I'm gonna do is turn off the robots because they're just bouncing around wasting thruster fuel. Um, if, you, if you were new here, um, I've probably played this too much, so I'm, I'm just gonna like rush through this probably. But the point of this room is actually to look around and watch how the robots move. So you can see that the red robot is following the walls. The blue robot is bouncing side to side. Sparky, the white robot, is bouncing up and down. Um, I'm going to turn off the remote to save battery. But you can wander around inside and see how they're wired. You can see that um, the blue robot, his name is Scanner. Actually, what pronoun do robots use? I'm just going to use they. Um, the, the blue robot uses um, not nearly enough battery power. Cool. Yeah. I, I, I actually get really worried about how fast the, the batteries drain. Um, but it's not so bad. I think I get too paranoid about, um, about the remote control. So as far as I can tell, the rules for battery power are that the rate at which the battery drains, it's proportional to how long your robot spends with its thrusters on. And it depends on, you know, like if you have four thrusters burning, then it runs your battery down four times as fast. Um, I don't know if you're penalized for just having the remote control on. I think you might be, but not very much. But I don't, I don't know for sure. I haven't actually reverse engineered that part of the game yet. Um, 
and oh there there is actually a um actually there is there is actually like a 16 bit like a detailed um view of the battery level so like there are more significant bits than what you're seeing in the animation and i could put that on the screen and then it would be easy to see what's going on but um it's been a while since i looked at that so that would be one thing we could do if we wanted to get a better idea of how that works so this is a chip um this one is preloaded with this design called the wall hugger, which you can learn about in one of the tutorials. Um, if you press question mark, it gives you some help in every level. So here it's telling you what the chips are. It's also telling you that there are black crystals and that they foil empire bots. And that's actually kind of important. Um, Yeah, and in the in the like sandbox part of the game, the innovation lab, if you're holding a chip and press question mark, then you get the data sheet. But the real game doesn't have data sheets. You just have to know what's on the chip, which is a little frustrating. I don't know if I actually like that. I think that's just unnecessarily mean, and I think I might make data sheets visible in the game. But that would be potentially a slight difference in gameplay in my version. All right, so let's go in here and turn all the thruster switches off. So this keeps the robots from moving around even when the remote's on. Um, and so this robot's got a circuit that bounces up and down. It has a flip-flop with two states. So um, I was gonna use the hot cursor to demonstrate a flip-flop, but I don't have the hot cursor in the game either. Um, if, you, if you make this input on the left um, red, like logic one or hot, then it turns the output on the top one, and then the other side, zero. It flips it, and vice versa. So this can sort of store one bit of information. It stores a little bit of state. So when the robot bounces on the top wall, this bumper is energized, and the flip-flop flips so that the left side is hot. And then it starts thrusting downward using the upper thruster. And then vice versa, when the bottom bumper triggers, then the flip-flop flips the other direction, into the state that it's in now, and it moves up. So we're gonna keep that one off. Same circuit, but only left and right. All right, let's put all the stuff in one robot. So let's just put all the items in Sparky right now. And that's because I want to look for a crystal soon, and Sparky has the crystal sensor wired up to the beeper right now. Oops. It's a little tricky sometimes to grab a robot with the mouse without going inside of the robot. It's still way faster than doing it with the keyboard, geez. Oops. Yeah, it would definitely help to cancel the mouse cue when I'm leaving a room, which I can do either by patching the game or by monitoring the current room ID and memory. All right, I'm gonna open this gate and then put the key back. Whoops, you can open it and close it. I wonder where the state, I haven't, there are all these like obvious questions like, oh, where does it store the state of memory, you know, the bit in memory for whether that gate is open. I just haven't looked. It's probably in this section right after the circuit where there are a bunch of little byte flags that are used for a bunch of miscellaneous stuff. Okay, so we want to keep all these items with us in the robot so that we've got the key, we've got the other robots, we've got plenty of battery power. Um, whoops. Okay. And so there's, there's like a maze down here where we can wander around and get some items that we'll want. There's a black crystal somewhere. Um, and so I think we'll want to turn on the robot and have it look for that. And then up here we've got this hallway with an enemy in it. Um, but before we go much further, I think I want to find that black crystal. Alright, so this is already wired up. I'm just going to turn it on. We don't need the thruster switch, just the sensors. And then I'm going to carry him around. Oh man. It's really, really too easy to go inside the robots like that. I'm going to use the keyboard for a bit, just until I get tired of the keyboard. The joystick is also kind of nice for mazes like this. 
So this is a this is a maze with a bunch of places where you can kind of get looped around and stuck. Oh, here's something we want. Oh, there we go. So now I can actually just walk around and the robot, um, oh, actually, is the robot wired up to grab? It isn't. If I hook up the robot's grabber, then the robot will just grab the crystal for me. Fishing for crystals. It's somewhere in this room, but it might be on that left side. The crystal's actually in a different location every time you start a game. I haven't yet checked to see how the randomization works. There it is. See that? It's black on black, but otherwise acts like a normal object. Oh yeah. This is a useful item too, the subway sensor. I mean, I guess, I don't know if I've ever actually needed this, but I don't know. I like the idea of this item, I guess. Ah, <sighs> well, if I, if I let go, it's gonna be easy to lose this, but I think we'll be fine. Oops. There we go. <laughs> okay, and let's let's keep it over here. Okay, it's no longer in a room with a crystal. All right, let's see if there's any more items. Um. Oh geez, the Empire Bot's out there somewhere, isn't it? I should just go fight the Empire Bot myself so it doesn't hurt my robots. I think I can just take this crystal and just give this crystal to the Empire Bot and it will, it will be dead. There it is, take that. Yeah. I think I just deactivated the Empire Bot. Okay, where's Crystal 2? Okay, I don't know if I need this black crystal again, but I'll, I'll put it somewhere I'm not gonna quite lose it. Like over here, somewhere kind of out of the way. I don't know if I have everything from this maze. Which is usually how these mazes work, but I feel like this one is particularly nerve-wracking because it loops so much. I mean, there are other mazes in this game that loop, um, but they're usually not like about collecting that many items. I don't know. So you can load chips in game. You just can't get the data sheet. So. Like, I don't know if it really matters that you get a specific chip. I think it's more about getting like empty chips that you can put stuff on. In this level, we're looking for chips one and two. Oh wait, two is already, we already have two. Two is in, in here, right? Okay, yeah, never mind. So we've got the chips, we got the subway token thing. I think we got all the items we care about. And this is a count to end chip, which takes pulses on the pin one, and then reset is pin two, I think. And then it sequentially lights up the other pins, which seems useful for sequencing operations. 
Okay, I think we have everything we need from this part of the sewer. I could wander around here all day, but I don't think I should. Okay, there's the de oops. There's the deactivated empire bot. There's a puzzle where the sentry just grabbed me for trying to rush in there and get the magnet. It's like, no magnet for you. Let's get a better view on this cat and open up my coffee and then do this puzzle. Have I completely scared off the Let's Play crowd with all the C++ code? from Trader Joe's. I think it's mostly iced coffee. Yeah, I don't know. Let's see what it tastes like. Oh yeah, that's tasty. All right, so this magnet's gonna be super useful later. Um, we won't need it for like a couple levels, but later in the game we'll We'll really nice it'll be really nice to have this um, all right so all the all the puzzles in this first level are solvable without rewiring the robots so you can just look at how the robots move and pick one that's appropriate for the puzzle you already have so this one moves side to side this one follows the walls let's use this one this is sparky Oops, I didn't mean to jump right into that. All right. So the wall hugger has a little state machine in it that tries to follow the wall, but also uh, kind of round corners when it falls off of the edge. The grabber was hooked up, right? Yeah. All right, so I can turn off the remote, walk back in here, and I think the grabber was hooked up to a key sensor. Yeah, with an aught gate. So I can turn off the thrusters and then hit the remote again, and now Sparky actually drops the magnet, and now I've just got the magnet hanging out here. Uh, I can keep my robots more organized with the mouse. Let's just keep this stuff somewhere. Sensor town, I don't know. Oops. <laughs> Just zap. Okay, so I got my magnet. What else can we get? So there's a crystal in there, and I think a robot that just bounces side to side will get that just fine. So you're up, scanner. Oops. Crystal Town. That'll be useful to recharge the batteries.
Alright. Whoops. Sometimes I click on something that would have been useful and then the room changes and yeah, I, I definitely need to clear the input queue when the room changes. just goes, yeah, that was where I came from. I think one of the other ones goes to the hallway with that little sailing ship thing. Yeah. Like, I think that's like a sewer monster of some sort. Patrol bot, a Dalek. Is that a Dalek? Oh, maybe that is a Dalek. You know, I hadn't seen Doctor Who when I first watched, when I first played this game. Huh. Yeah, actually, maybe it is a Dalek. I assumed it was like a pirate ship. Huh. Alright, so we've already done everything down here. That went to the little side grate thing. I think we just need to go up here now. I think we've got everything. Get this thing. The first level in this game is almost a tutorial still. It just also has that element of, do I have everything? Okay. Now we can ride. Oops. We can ride this same robot. No. Okay, that was really almost a problem. <laughs> I was gonna move down and speed up the emulation, and then, of course, moving the mouse almost has me leaving the robot, which would have been disastrous. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Use the key to open the door. All right, well, we are ready to transport to the next level. Normally this would be a great time to save our game, but I've been saving my game like continuously, so. Incidentally, this might be a good time to mention that the back button would just like take you to a previous save. And if you did want to save your game specifically, you could press escape and then S. And, oh no, does that crash also? Did I just break file saving? I did, I want to fix file saving. Cause I kind of, I kind of want to save this. Hold please. I think this is just a bug in the JavaScript code. I refactored a bunch of this recently, and this is what I get for not having tests. Oh yeah, file name for save data, I need to import that. test this locally and then if it works I can just deploy it. Oh yeah, um, Mr. X on YouTube says that this circuit diagram game looks intelligent and funny. Yeah, it does have a nice sense of humor. It's got, um, it's definitely got some jokes in it.
Yeah, I definitely scared everyone away with the C++. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, if it doesn't crash, you press Escape S and then you get a file, which is just the game's native save format. Cool, let's fix this. It doesn't really need to do a clean build, but I guess you're seeing a clean build. I mean, it's probably good practice to do a clean build before deploying to the production site, right? So the Python is that SB SBT86 thing, um, which disassembles the original game by shelling out to NASM and then processing the resulting assembly. A lot of these files are for the Z standard compression library that we're also building with no legacy support. <laughs> Saves a few bytes. Yeah, the, the WebAssembly is pretty nice and small. It's 1.4 megs uncompressed and compressed. Oh, look at that, 390K. Of course, we use gzip transfer encoding. Could use a different kind of compression, but like using something that the browser natively supports seemed like a good idea. All right, so I can go switch back to the production site. All right, let's make sure this works. Yay, we can save. Okay, so that, that must have been the same problem behind saving chips. Let's see if we can save chips now. Yeah, and in fact, Yeah, so you you do end up getting the chip name in the file name. That's what that missing function I was importing was supposed to do, is come up with a good name, like World 1, or Lab, or Tuco Chippo. So. All right, there will be more development later, but let's avoid scaring everyone away. Oh yeah, and it does have a maximum width that it wants to get to, which you might end up hitting on desktop. If you just zoom in the browser, you can get it to exceed that though, if you really want it to be full screen. Imagine that, but on PC speaker, and it's that was pretty much it. Oh yeah, Mr. X says that I must be really eager to make progress. Yeah, definitely. I, I get really into projects like this. All right, so we just came out through the toilet because uh, we were just in the sewer, and now we're in the BART station. <laughs> so, oh yeah, what is the help text for this level like? Ride the subway to the town. 
find the token, ride the subway, use the exit ticket. So yeah, we've we've done this level in the in this channel before. Um, I played through this before the autosave and the mouse. Um, we could load our file from that, but this seems like some good playtesting. Yep, yep, nope. All right, so I can build a circuit that goes in there. Um, this is the one where you put the key in and then opens a small hole in the door. Oops. Yeah, leaving a robot with the mouse is a little treacherous. Oh, you have to leave the key in here. Right. Which robot should I wire up for this? Should we just keep using Sparky? Or Checkers, I mean? Um, so checkers. It's bouncing up and down. Yeah, I mean, I seem to remember before we just kind of made the up and down bounce continue and go left or right based on whether or not we have something um, grabbed yet. Um, You do actually need to use this uh, sensor to notice when you're at the right um, like kind of horizontal location and then stop, because otherwise you'll just overshoot it. So, let's see. I think we want to just make the up and down side of this unconditional. this with the robot turned on. Okay, so this would just be bouncing up and down and that's it. And moving to that side, which is not what I want. Oh gosh, that coffee is strong. What have I done? Oh no. Okay, so this will, this output will be on when the token is in that direction. So as long as we're in that, the token's in that direction and we don't currently have the token. So let's get a not grabber output. I also want, I want one of these circuits. Let's take this out. Come here, key sensor. So I want the inverted and non-inverted grabber signals. So I'm going to the grabber up to a node here. Oops. So actually grab the middle of the node. Make that tidier. Okay, so if I have something, I'm always going to try to come back. If I don't have something and I still need to move more in that direction. I'll move. I 
Let's put some of this other stuff inside scanner. Including Sparky. <laughs> Okay, so we have the up and down, we have the move that direction, move that direction. All right, thrusters on. So also this is not a blue sentry, it's a white sentry. So we could ride in the robot and like pilot it if we wanted to, but we can do this, oops, we can do this autonomously. Let's do that. So I'm gonna hit the remote. Um, oh no. All right, let's use our back button. Oh, right, I can't use the key for that because, right, because there is a key in the room. All right, let's just, <sighs> never mind. <laughs> it seemed so convenient at the time. I feel like they do that just to annoy you. I'm, I'm sure that's intentional. Yay. And off. Okay, so let's, let's, oops. I didn't mean to keep going up there. Let's just take this key. Let's reconnect that uh, circuit here that drops items when there's a key in the room. Turn off the thrusters. Okay, so now it, it's dropped the token. All right, we've got our first subway token. The first subway token is different than the subsequent subway tokens. Um, it, it's re it'll reappear at a different location later. Oh, cool. Concrete says that this is running great on their ancient Samsung Galaxy S3. Well, that's good to hear. Yeah, I've been trying to keep this pretty light. Like, I would... I would be using less memory right now, except that I'm already at the minimum that Mscripten lets me allocate, which is 16 megabytes. I think the heaviest part of initialization right now might be initializing the compression dictionaries. Um, or, well, I mean, it's probably still, the heaviest thing is probably still compiling the WebAssembly, but, um, yeah, maybe maybe the compression is probably like close. I haven't actually profiled that recently though. Oops, and I didn't mean to open that right now. Okay, well we've got one subway token. We could ride the subway. Um, we could explore. What else is what else is here? Is there anything else? I think we're mostly boxed in and have to ride the subway repeatedly to get items. So we could put a token in there and ride the subway. Um, yeah, let's just do that. Oh yeah, doing this would have been really hard if I had the, if I still was, um, if I still have the code set up to automatically speed up the game when there are repending mouse events, because you would just run out of time to go through the turnstile. Oh no, like that. Oh no! See, I just went inside the robot by mistake, and then I couldn't use the turnstile. Uh, let's use the autosave. Oops. Not quite that far back. Okay. Let's do this part with the keyboard. I think that would be alright with the joystick too, but 
That's also a problem with the mouse. All right, so then we have this vending machine. You can open this, but you need the robot to go pull or push the button for you. <laughs> That's satisfying. So um, I think the way I was doing this before was just with any robot that's programmed to bounce up and down. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we can just use this robot as is. So let it change state. Stick it right next to the wall. All right. I can turn its thrusters off again. Yay, now we can ride the subway. This would be a good time to save the game. Oops. So to do this, oops, you pick up the robot, and then you pick up the train while you're picking up the robot. For a while, oh! Any mouse movement cancels it. <laughs> yeah, okay. I don't think that station is interesting, very interesting. Um, this one, I think, might just have the battery charger. Oh no, this has chip three. We needed this. All right, so now we have to reacquire the subway token. There's a one-way gate that we can go out through. Down here is just more exits, I think. Yeah. It's like plumbing. So now, now there's the token. It's down there in the sewer grate. So I was doing this before using a robot that was um, programmed to start out on this floor right here and then move along the floor until it hits the bumper against the wall and then to move up and then to kind of reset and then do the opposite when it actually has the token. So let's keep this robot programmed with its up and down thing because we'll need that like, again to call the... Oh, actually, can we? I mean, it is tempting to try using the same subway token retrieval circuit, but I think if you do that, you'll find that the robot gets stuck like over here. Uh, but since we've got autosave, we can try this just to see what it's like. Yeah. Um... All 
right. So without doing that, um, I think before I just was hugging the side of the wall, I'm wondering if maybe it might be easier to modify this so that maybe it just doesn't get stuck in that corner. <laughs> imagine doing that with either a delay of some sort or noticing when it hits that bottom wall first. Yeah, like what if I wanted it to only start moving after the first time it hits the bottom wall? This is maybe more complicated than the solution needs to be, but I like I like having this robot be a little bit more general purpose so I don't have to rewire it as much. Whatever that means. I'm probably gonna have to rewire it anyway. I'm just picking a solution. Let's maybe use the key to reset this. I don't know if I even want this to have stayed. I'm gonna do this with a flip-flop. I don't know if, I don't know if this, I might regret this. So the key will reset the flip-flop to the default state and ungrab, and then the Turn thruster is enabled by um, the bottom bumper. Okay. So I can't ride inside this one because it's a blue sentry. Let's try that. Oops. Oh no. Oh right, because it bounced a bunch um, on its way out there. So no, that does not actually help. Um, Yeah, I mean, the way I did this before, just following the walls, maybe I, maybe I should, should just do it that way again. Just want to start over. Just rip all the gates out of this robot. Um, Well, let's just, I think what I actually meant was when I have the crystal and the bottom bumper hits, so let's just do that. Slightly messy. Oh, 
Uh-oh. Oh. Okay, I guess that I guess this approach is just flawed. All right. All right, all right. Let's rip this up and do the other thing. There should be an easier way to rip up circuits. on a clean slate here. Yeah, I do like how you can nest the robots so much. Oh yeah, a button to kill all the wires, that would be nice, yeah. And that would be easy to implement too, like I think I already know the information necessary to... Well, I don't know, I, I'd want to study the, the circuit format more before making tools that modify the in-memory circuit, because there's a lot of it, like interdependent parts of, of that data structure. I'd want to make sure I'm doing it correctly. Okay. Um, so I think the way I did this before, which maybe, maybe I'll just try doing that again, is I started the robot with just its bumper right up against the bottom wall, and I just program it so if that bumper is energized, then the corresponding thruster is energized to push it along this wall, and then likewise, if this bumper is energized, then I push it along this wall, just kind of illustrating over here where the sensor isn't. Um, and then as soon as I grab the thing, I switch modes and just swap the swap those two behaviors. So let's put an AND gate on all the outputs. And then if, if I'm against this surface, then I want this thruster to turn on. If I'm against this surface, I want this thruster. Um, but actually I want the ability for this one to turn on for the return trip and that one for the return trip. So I need to split that signal. That is frustrating when you can't quite tell which node the wire is connecting to and you end up picking the one that's already got a wire on it and you disconnect both instead of making a new connection. All right, and then I can pick between these two with, um, really I just need two signals that are the same polarity as the grabber and two that are opposite polarity as the grabber.
Okay, so this is the one that will connect to the two thrusters we're starting with. Let's turn off the thruster switch and turn on the remote so we can see the electricity flow. So by default, we want to move or have the ability to move this way and this way. And then these two for the other direction. Let's tidy up the wires very slightly. Um, <laughs> yes, tidy. All right, let's just give that a shot. So I've got to put that right there. Oh no. Oh, I didn't have the th grabber powered. Oops. Let's get that key sensor. Okay. Thanks, autosave. Okay, so I should just be able to repeat that when I need another subway token, which will happen periodically. Um, I guess this would be easier if I had a carrying bag as my outer robot, like scanner. And then let's put you inside scanner and then let you drop the token. And then with this circuit, it's kind of handy because none of my thrusters will be on. So I could leave the thruster switch armed, I guess. It's a little, maybe a little dangerous, but. Oh man, I'm also noticing myself using the space bar to grab and then the mouse to move, which is a pretty weird combo. Let's see if I can do this with the turnstile. Yeah. Okay, do I have any robots that I can use to call the train? Or did I unwire my one that would? Let's just wire this one as a vertical bouncer. Another one of those. <laughs> just just needed one of those to call the train. Alright, we have called the train again, and we can ride it to another destination. Without moving the mouse until we want to get off. Okay, that at the chip. Oh, what does this have? Oh, that's the battery charger. 
I don't need the battery charger. I'm glad it exists, but I don't need the battery charger. Let's go back. Sears and Robot. I don't think this station has anything good either. Oh, this has an exit ticket sensor. Do we need this? You have to collect all the items in this game, right? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if we need that at all, but I guess it's worth getting. Let's uh, get another ticket or token. Too much robot. Um, let's turn this one off. Used our token retrieval device. <laughs> A nerve wracking part where you actually try to get through the turnstile. Let's use this robot to call the button. All right, next, what else do we need from the subway? Jack in the bot station. Oh, I think that's actually where we need to go later. Um, let's try this one first. Oh, is this nothing good? Oh, no, this is chip four. Actually, was there another way to get here? Yeah, can't we get here without riding the subway? Let's get this, I don't know, let's get this without taking the subway. I think we want to skip that Use a Robotique station. Laundra bot station. This is where we get a ticket, I think. Yeah. Oop. Sorry, Sentry. I didn't mean to. So. Okay. Okay, that, that's the actual, it's like I walked past it right as I came into this room, but that's the thing that closes off. I think I can get to that magnet part without going out through here, right? Because that's the actual one-way door. I don't think there's anything useful up there. I think we just need to get the exit ticket and then get that chip. Anything else that we care about and then just get out of here. 
Okay, so I think the wall hugger will get us through this maze. Let's turn off the bots we're not using. This is the wall hugger chip. And the grabber's turned on. I don't know why we needed that exit ticket sensor. Oops. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, I, I know, I know. Okay, let's let's get organized. Let's put uh no, I know that. Stop that. Let's put this up here. And then let's get you ready to start the maze. Hugger chip might not be the most reliable way to solve this. Pretty sure this worked last time. Oh. So that thing where it went fast, um, I was pressing keys on the keyboard and then um, there's a feature which actually speeds up the engine if there's um, stuff waiting in the keyboard queue. Oh. Oh man, did I manage to walk into the robot and then the sentry grabbed me and the robot and then moved us both over here? And then I just wasted it by letting the robot go back over there. No, nope, no. back over here and I can grab you. No, I'm so you can just grab this. I just need to get it at the right time. I could also certainly make a custom circuit for this problem. Okay, yes, thanks. That's what I wanted. <laughs> I'm just gonna be really lazy and just disconnect the key sensor, but let's put this inside my carrying robot. Let it drop the exit ticket. Cool. Okay, let's get that magnet. And then I think we can get out of here. So yeah, this is the one way exit. And then there's the chip. Sorry, yeah, the, we already have the magnet, but the chip that's stuck in the magnet, rather. Chips three and four are blank. I mean, I should know that, because I, I know that all the chips except for one and two are blank, because I was just working on the level loader. Okay, I think we've got everything out of this level. So we need to get one more subway token, and then we can get out of here. wired it for what. This is going to be my call button and this is going to be my getting the subway token, right? Go, little robot. Yeah. Good job, bot. Okay. Oops. 
So I've got the last subway token I'm gonna need. And my bots are doing all right. I don't think I need to use the battery charger in this level. gonna call the train for me. <laughs> Going the long way from the left side of the robot to the right side. All right, so this one has two exits. Oh gosh, I didn't mean to leave my robot there. So, if I go this way, that's just right where we were. So that's kind of interesting, right? But we already know that that doesn't do anything. Um, if we go up here, there's an exit ticket inlet here and some kind of pixely thing over here which I think is supposed to be an escalator. Let's turn off this robot. Okay so you see we just have to leave this in the slot and that makes the escalator run. And now we can actually walk up here. Without the esc I mean, I should make sure the collision detection still works like it's supposed to, but without that, this is blocking you, and there's actually no teleporter up there. But when you put that in there, you can walk up here. Stand right on top. Ah, and now we're on the next level. Where are we? We're in the town. Weather the magnetic storm with a shield in a bot. Turn it on. Sometimes junk can open doors. A form 12 is your ticket to the master control room. And two more blank chips to look for. All right, now we've got a, uh, a maze here. So this is actually where I noticed something that might be useful for getting, for noticing like how to get through this. So if you hold your bot over the side of the, the room, you can tell whether it wraps around or not. So it looks like this doesn't actually wrap though. Maybe, that, maybe it was useful elsewhere. So I think this is actually a couple of rooms that all look identical. So there's some state that you're changing by moving around that you can't quite see. Okay, this is one of the places you need to get. So this is the magnetic storm shield. Let's hang out inside scanner. Um, so I don't know, I don't know what the deal is with the magnetic storm sensors, right? Like, it doesn't seem like it's really useful to know where the magnetic storm is but you can use this to turn any sensor into the magnetic storm sensor. So I'm thinking maybe, oh, if the sensor is anywhere nearby, you could save power by turning on. Oh yeah, that's what I should do. I should turn on, I should turn one of my in-room sensors into a magnetic storm sensor. Uh, so I don't really care about the direction. Let's use this. I don't think I really need the crystal sensor. Do I need the key sensor? I think I can get a new key sensor later. So let's overwrite the key sensor. Cool. So we now have a sensor that tells us if there's a magnetic storm in the same room. 
And if so, we can turn on the shields. Because I think if we use the sensor that tells us if we're touching the magnetic storm, it's already too late. And while it's kind of cool to watch them move around with the directional sensor, I don't think that's really useful. Okay, now I can just keep, keep the remote on if I'm going to be in an area with the magnetic storms. And I've got one more key sensor in case I need those. There's one place we can go. Alright, we got some magnetic storms and the sensor is telling us to... Uh, so this will drain our battery a little bit, but not nearly as bad as if we actually get hit by the magnetic storms. Okay, I don't know how to get to chip 5. I want chip 5. It's like over there. Oh yeah, this is where we do still need the subway direction, token directional sensor. So let's actually wire this up. Um, so we want to grab that token. So we want the grabber. I have to keep the remote on even though I'm wiring the bot because uh, otherwise the shield stops working. So let's, let's do this live. Um, So the thrusters are not actually on right now, but I can turn them on in just a sec. Whoa. Robot inception. Oh, that worked. Cool. been here before. more rooms that all look the same. Oh no, these actually don't look completely the same. Oh, it's a button sensor. Oh, and a crystal. And then that room in the on the other side um, is actually the last room in this level. That's where we have to give that garbage looking like robot thing in that room like a picture or the uh, a uh, little square thing that says F12 on it before we can continue. Six. So two is in my wall hugger bot right now. And five is, I don't know where to get five right now. We've seen it, but we don't know how to actually get there. Or at least I don't know how to get there right now. Maybe one of you knows. Hmm. That's useful. You could use that to remote control a robot, right? Like you could use that to, by picking up and moving around the key, like you could send it different signals. That's cool. Oops. Um, I 
think we're wandering along, wandering through the town right now. The streets of Robotropolis. Whoa. Okay, so that's a puzzle we can do with two robots. I don't remember where that leads. I think that might be the way out. I want, like we should do that, but I, we might want to try to find that chip first. Have I been up here? I think I've been up there. Oops. been here. And here. <laughs> it's the same thing. And then this is... This is closer to where we saw the chip, but I didn't see a way... I don't know if it is that way. That's what I want, that five chip right there. I think this is just the, the entrance from before. <sighs> Do we need to actually map this out properly? probably wouldn't be from that direction. But hmm. these are all the same, yeah. hint from a YouTube chat that there is another exit from the storm area. There are three right exits. puzzle. Here's another right exit. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Elevator card. Whoops. I can put that directly into the elevator. call button ourselves. There's a little sensor we can take with us. Ah, 
Oh, this is the this is the item we need to get out. This is the form F12. So we can't walk up there, but the robots can. Um, I think did I solve this on the stream already? Um, I I did this recently. I just forgot whether it was on the stream or whether it was just by myself. Um, I think we did this on the stream. So you need to put the token in there, which we got earlier. One robot can just be holding that in its grabber and drop it when it's near there. And then we have to wait for the other robot to, um, well, we, the sequence of events is that we have to drop the token in here. Another robot pulls this and then some robot grabs the form F12. Um, you could use different events to actually sequence those operations. I think the way I did this before is I just have the robot move up until it hits something with its bumper, and then I release the grabber. Um, and then I would want to wait until... Um, I mean, I could just be thrusting up the entire time, um, but I need to need some notification for when it's time to come back. So you can't necessarily use just the upper bumper because you're hitting this previously also. Um, you could use sort of grabbing something again. You could use like a radio signal. You could use an item detector. A lot of ways to do this. Which robots should we use? There's a wall hugger. And this one is a fairly specific circuit from before. Okay, can we, um, man, I'm kind of wishing I grabbed that other chip first. Let's just, let's just do this puzzle, and then we have to remember to get that chip, and then we can do the final puzzle and get out of this level. So, checkers, I guess, can be our puller. Uh, I kind of just want a clean slate here. So up here, I want to start out going up and then right when my grabber engages. And then when I get a signal, um, I need to use some signaling mechanism to tell this robot when it's done, or when, when we're done with it holding, holding on. So I'm thinking maybe we want, we want to use a flip-flop to hold the state here, to have this robot in sort of an outgoing or a homecoming kind of state. Okay, um, I guess we want the grabber engaged in the outgoing state only, which is kind of one of the main features of the two states. Um, and let's use the bottom bumper to reset. the remote to be on this whole time. Probably shouldn't be. Okay, so we could think about like 
the logic behind each of the thrusters here. So we want to go up if we're in the kind of initial state and there's nothing in the grabber. We want to go down if we're in that return state. Um, and we can think about up and down pretty much independently in this particular problem. And then for left and right, um, we don't ever need to go toward the lever and we only need to pull the lever when we have that grabber signal. So in fact, we can disconnect the pulling thruster directly to the grabber. And then the outgoing state and the return state. Oh yeah, and return is initiated by antenna. Oops. <laughs> Sometimes I press escape to cancel my wires, which is not the right thing to press. I'm just going to use a node there to keep it slightly less messy, maybe. I don't know, man. So that'll be my return signal. That's pretty straightforward. Let's just turn this on. So we'll start out going up. Then we'll grab, we'll be going up and right. We could add some gating here so that we're not going up the entire time unnecessarily, um, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, we're a little low on thruster battery, but I don't really feel like optimizing this right now. We've got plenty of power. Oh my God. There's some shaking. Did somebody drop something next door or was that an earthquake? Still actually don't know whether that was an earthquake or not. It might have just been somebody dropping something heavy next door, because sometimes that happens. Okay, this robot is a mess. I don't really need the wall hugger right now and it's easy to rewire, so let's take this out. It's a good noise, right? So scanner is my junk pile. Let's put scanner over here. Oops. You can stay right there. You need to be in grabber range of that pole thing.
would be. Oh, what do we have in the window there? Oh, that was an earthquake map. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm you know, that's probably fine. That didn't quite feel like an earthquake. It felt more like something dropping really, something, somebody dropping a heavy object like in an adjacent part of the building, but it could have been an earthquake. This was the coffee, that wasn't the coffee. <sighs> okay. I'm just gonna be a pile of nerves thanks to that. It is also a little confusing walking in and out of the robots thanks to the mouse motion. Let's put scanner over here. So this robot needs to be somewhere that it can grab that form F12. And I'm gonna put this token nearby and it'll grab the token. Um, and so this can also have um, like an outgoing and return mode controlled by a flip-flop. And I can also use this to reset the other robot. Um, yeah, actually, in fact, I think I only want it to reset the other robot. I don't want this to bounce back up into the area where I can't grab it. So when it reaches the bottom, and I'll just have to reset it manually. Or maybe I'll use the left bumper to reset it because I don't expect that to happen. Oh, hey, Tuco, are you okay? And then once I've grabbed the thing, I mean, another strategy here is that I, I use, um, so there are a bunch of ways to do this. I could have another bit of state, like another flip-flop that keeps track of whether um, I've ever had nothing in the grabber. So to notice like the second time that I pick something up rather than the first time. Um, you know, I do have that count to end chip that I could use. Um, Let's just open up the innovation lab in a separate window. I can show you how the count the count to end chip works. Um, one thing that's missing here is a way to load chips from the chip library, because uh, the chip library is in the game right now, but you can't quite really access it. Um, Uh, you can sort of do it though by picking up a chip, hitting load file, and then if you already have the chip on your, or the file you want to load on your machine, like count to n, which should already be loaded into chip one in the game, and then immediately press L, and then you just see this in the data sheet. So there's an input, there's a reset, and then eight outputs. F or S. I just saved a copy of the chip. 
meant to press S for soldering, not S for save chip. So I could actually wire this up into the big chip just so that we could have pins that have uh, like nice, like the little pins, you can't really use uh, the hot cursor to interact with them interactively. So sometimes it's nice to hook it up to a big chip. So those are the outputs. Let's turn on the remote. So reset turns off all the outputs. And on, on a rising edge, so after this goes high, then a little while later, you see the uh, input step, to, or the output step to the next pin. And then it just gets stuck at the last one. So this is a pretty useful chip. We might want to use this. It's good for sequencing things. Oh, that's weird. The tip of the soldering iron separates from the soldering iron itself when I push it up against that. That's funny. You know, I think in this game, sprites are single color. And so maybe this, I think the soldering iron tip is actually technically a separate sprite. And this, like, I think you see that with robots that are holding things and you push them across this line. I think the way that this does the collision detection, the objects separate slightly. All right, so return. I think this will be... I think this might be a little easier if I start out with the robot actually holding the token rather than having to acquire the token. Um, let's, oh, let's turn checkers off temporarily. And then let's just pick up this token. Yeah. Okay. Now what I'm gonna do is when we let go of that and then um, that'll swap this. So when we let go of the subway token, that'll swap this flip-flop. And then when we pick up the, uh, the thing that we're actually trying to get, the, what is that again? The F12 form, um, then that'll go high again. This is supposed to be reset. Okay, now this is the signal for when do we start coming back. So I think that would be when we grab something after we've had the grabber empty. So I think we need an AND gate and a node for that. Let's also have a reset node. I'm using the left bumper as a reset signal.
So when I ungrab something, this not gate's output will go high. This flip flop will flip. The other side of this and gate will be energized, um, but this side won't be. There's a bit of a gate delay hazard there, isn't there? I think that'll be fine. Um, Cause I think this output on the right will go low and then the output on the left will go high. So this won't be high when we're dropping something. But when we, then when we pick something up for the second time, this will flip and we'll start coming back. And then when we hit the bottom, then we'll send a signal to get the other robot coming back also. So let's try it. I'm gonna hit R. That was anticlimactic. I forgot to make it release. Okay. Um, thank goodness for that autosave. Yeah. Uh, I need to make this release when it hits something with its top bumper. I think that's all it needs. I can take this sensor, put it somewhere else. Okay, let's try this again. Oh, did I not have the th thruster switch turned on? I didn't. Yeah, that would be a problem too. All right. Third time the charm or something. That was it. All right, I can turn off checkers. Put everyone back in here. I can get uh, Sparky to release the form by holding something against the top bumper. All right, there's my form F12. Acquired from the vending machine. Okay, I can take the elevator back down. Cool, um, we need the magnetic storm doohickey for the next bit. Should be fine. We just need to make sure the thrusters on the other bots are off. All right. Oh, is it this one? Yes, okay, cool. That's what I was missing. Oh, why can't I take you inside the robot? There we go, whoops. Inside too many robots. Ah, so many chips. Okay, let's get out of this storm. Okay, so I think, was this, yeah, this is where we go now. So it's a good old two robot button puzzle. Oh, was that actually an earthquake? Magnitude 3.8. So not very big, but really close by. Interesting. <sighs> Is Tuco still hanging out over here? Anyway, I need to take a quick restroom break and then let's do this puzzle. And then I think we can 
can be pretty close to getting out of this level. What should we do here? This might be a good time to take a quick break and talk about the uh, what you might find in the debug console. So, ooh, look at our auto saves. Still nice and small. Um, by the way, um, I feel like I should be tweeting these out on Scanlime Live the auto saves occasionally while we're playing this. So if you want this exact save game file, Scanlime Live just tweeted it out. So if you're in this save console or in this uh, JavaScript console, you'll see an RO engine object. Um, this is the WebAssembly, but it's also got some other stuff on it. Um, there's some constants like screen height and CPU clock hertz, <laughs> four megahertz, man. Um, let's see. You can also do stuff like get memory. And this is actually just a view into the memory as experienced by the real mode 16-bit code that this is running. Um, you know, you can also get other stuff like the current save file buffer. You can compress the save file, which is much smaller. Um, I could start corrupting the save file by editing it in JavaScript if I wanted. Uh, there's also, um, if you feel like it, there's set cheats enabled, and you can read the source code to see how that works, but it's, it's actually an original cheat mechanism that the game always had that I found, and I added a function that enables that if you're interested in that. But it just lets you walk, walk through walls, which is kind of helpful, but like not actually the most powerful cheating mechanism they could have added. Um, and then there's some input stuff. There's not a lot for just inspecting the contents of the game's in-game data structures yet. There's more of that accessible from the C++ side currently. But, I mean, you could actually, um, if you knew where to look in this uh, thing returned by git memory, you could just edit that. But it's a little hard to find. It's a little easier to find stuff in um, if you ask for the save file, but you can also ask for it to do a save. So save game. Um, that downloaded a file because that was actually the default callback for the save game handler. But that save game actually, that was the same as if I was in the game and pressed escape and S. Um, that was just calling that function in the game directly. And then um, the callback downloaded it, but you can also just access the buffer directly. Um, and then because it's still in the buffer, 
we could call load game and that just restores what's what was in the buffer. So, you know, not that interesting, but it might be useful. I thought about it, how, how it might be interesting to have maybe instances of this game embedded in an iframe um, for some kind of interactive documentation or walkthrough. That might be kind of neat. All right, so how do we how do we want to do this puzzle that I keep wandering into? So you can imagine breaking this up into two robots programmed to go out, down, and then over versus out, up, and then over. Um, just like identical programming, but swap that up versus down. Um, and so if that keeps the sentry away, then I can wander over there and collect the robots and we can all make our way forward. So out, down, and then back. Um, It's tempting to use that count to end chip for this. Um, just like two copies of it, one in each robot. Um, could also just do this with flip flops. Let's just sketch out what a really simple flip flop circuit would look like for this. Let's clean up this mess. These flip-flops don't reset when you take them out of the toolbox, which is kind of funny. See, they're all in like different states, depending on what I was doing with them last. Um, so this would just move it until it hits the wall and then stops. Um, and then when it's in that state, it would move it down. And then when I hit the bottom wall, and reset could be left bumper. Let's actually reset this right now, just to make this easier to reason about. Okay, so that reset both of these. And then this will go into its other state when we actually hit the bottommost wall. And then it'll start moving this direction. So that's not, I don't know, not the most elegant, but I don't think I could do better than two flip-flops, really. So I think we just build the equivalent circuit, but upside down in another robot. So two flip-flops reset by the left bumper, and then we have one state change when we hit the right wall, and one state change when this one hits the bottom wall. And I'm not worrying about extra thruster power we're wasting. Oops. I meant to grab that robot and not go inside it. Oops. Really is easy to overshoot with the mouse navigation.
reset this one too. Alright, now default state here is going to be going out that way until we hit the wall. Now we're going to go up until we hit that wall. And then we're going to go backwards. I think that's all we needed. Let's turn everybody on. Whoa, <laughs> taking a long way. Let's maybe use the keyboard to let these, to lay these out. Okay, and these can just kind of start in about the same spot. They don't have to be perfectly synchronized in this puzzle, but simulator puzzles require that. What does that mean? What? I don't remember. I, I vaguely remember this, but what is this? I should know about this. Okay, that's great. I'm sure some people out there appreciate that right now. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so we just did the thing. Let's collect our other robot. Sorry about that, just texting my friend with a brief update. All right, yeah, first, uh, is that the first on-stream earthquake? Oh, there's Tuco. Yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad other people recognize the reference. It seems like it was a good reference. I'm sorry I didn't get it right away. I'm clearly uncultured because I haven't seen all the 50s cinema. Me too, go. Okay, um, where were we before? All that happened. I think we just need to go through this and uh, exit the level, right? We've got the chip, we've got all our robots. Let's turn off our robots. Batteries are doing all right. All the levels ahead have battery rechargers. As long as we're not starting the level with empty batteries, I think we're doing fine. And we've got crystals here, so. Yeah, I think we're doing all right. This battery is a little low. Whew. All right, let's go for it. What's out here? Whoa. Oh, okay, this is new. This is new. I vaguely remember this. So there's, oh, okay, there's a way you can get back. Did they just add that for fun? That's kind of, just so that, they would have some more passageways. I, I mean, I do appreciate these little passageways. I think they're fun. Okay, so. So 
So this is like a ventilation shaft or something. I think robots can go in there, but I can't. Oh, and there's a button I have to press with my robot. Okay, well, I've got a button sensor though, so I think I can just have the robot steer over toward it. Um, so I think the button turns off the like force field or fans or whatever those are supposed to be. So if I move, um, I think I want to unconditionally move right until, so I, I mean, I'm thinking about using the, the button sensor I have to do like X, Y positioning, like move until you're at the same like kind of horizontal position as the button. Um, but that won't work when I'm in this room. So I think when I'm in this room, I need to rely on a flip flop or something unless I can like hold the robot through there. Can I, can I like put the robot into the other room from this room? I don't think I can. Kinda, not really. So, and this room is also a practice for the other room. See, they're the same, same shape rooms. So we might as well use this room as a practice. Um, although without the button sensor, it doesn't really do that much good if I'm using that for navigation. Anyway, which robot should we use? Which one do I feel like taking apart now? Which one has battery power? Yeah, let's use checkers. Clear the breadboard. Oh yeah, man, Aradol must be a, 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 a pro at this game. They've been giving me hints on YouTube chat. Um, they're mentioning that there's a weird thing with the directional sensor where as the robots move into the room, both the left and right trigger at the same time. That's cool. And they're also reminding me that I have a key directional sensor, which, yeah, that would be great for prototyping this, right? If I want to make a copy of this puzzle, I could use the key and the key directional sensor. That's cool. Let's try that. I don't prototype nearly as often as I should, either in real life or in this game. I'm also going to send this uh, save game to chat, just in case anyone else wants to play along in this particular location. So I know that looks ugly, sorry, but if you click it, it'll bring you right back where I am. I want to make a nicer looking version of that that uses a, uh, a, a thumbnail also, but it seems useful to be able to encode the entire save state, the entire save state into the URL like that. Hmm. So it's almost like I want two modes, like one for kind of launching and then one for seeking. Um, So let's, let's say, for example, I have this flip-flop that has launching mode on the left side and seeking mode on the right side. And let's say I transition between the two using the bumpers. So maybe I'll reset it on the left bumper, but then switch to seeking mode when I first hit that right wall. Um, and then let's just assume that we want to be able to move in all four directions. I don't know if we do, but let's say we want to move in this direction if we're in that initial state. 
And then after we're in the initial state, we want to go up or down. In this case, I think up if we see something on that right wall. So let's also have a node here. All right, so then maybe we want to be able to um, I was thinking about adding some AND gates so that we're only using this in that second mode, but actually, I don't think it does any harm to have this ORed in under that first mode. Let's find out. simulation environment. Oh yeah, that's not helping. Um, so we need um, we need the bumper to turn off the upper thruster. Like my wires overlapping. Cool. And this doesn't need the grabber because in the real world or in the real puzzle, it just needs to sit on the button, I think. do. Let's put the button sensor in there instead of the key sensor. Let's put the key back in our inventory bot. We can just, we can just rip the other sensor out of here if we want. Never should be, but whatever. Just to the right, if it's to the below, and if it's above. So it's sort of like we're following the directional sensor, but then we have this override that gets triggered when we're against the right wall that forces us to go up and not down. And then separately, there's also a feature where um, we're keeping track of this sort of reset state. And then if we haven't hit the right wall yet, then we're also definitely going in that direction. So and I can hit that and start it. And so if I just let it go anywhere here, then it would just go and then stop. Now it's reset. Let's try this out. Ah, 
Oh, yeah. Okay. That's the thing you were just talking about, warning me about, where it uh, is giving me both the left and right outputs. So now my robot is stuck. Weird. Okay, so we do actually have to, um, to not use the output of that sensor until we hit the wall. So let's go back to our last autosave. No, further back. This, this one will work. All right, so... Yeah, I think we just need to only allow this when we're in that second state. So we just need one more AND gate. Hey, Duke. There we go. That should do it. Let's reset. Okay. Let it auto save. <laughs> and turn it on. That's better. Yeah. Let's put our robot back in and turn it off. Oh, Tuco, honey. He's just got these couple of things in my shop that he's always interested in, and I don't know why. Like, they're not, they're not toys, they're not, like, they, I think they just have textures that remind him of other things that he likes. Maybe he just knows that they get my attention. I don't know. Oh, so we've got another little passageway here. Okay, that's just an extra little passage. I think this is the end of the level. I think we're about ready to move on. So we need to give this the form. He throws it away. <laughs> throws away my magnetic storm sensor or shield thing. And then gives me a teleporter. Oops. Now we are in the computer center, and we have a floppy disk. We can't read the floppy disk yet, but we can get help for the entire level. A central robot can become your friend. The sweeper bot likes to keep the hallways clean. Chips seven and eight are blank. So let's save the, save the floppy disk. Got these great security cameras in all the level or all the rooms here. Chip seven. So after this level, we have all the chips in the game. There are eight chips. Oh, yeah. So we can't go past there. There's a laser. Oh, that's the sweeper bot. Chip eight. So this level is much harder than the ones previously. <laughs> this is where the game's difficulty curve starts really ramping up or accelerating. It's not so much of a ramp. Okay, so this is the actual end of the level. Um, I think all we need to actually exit the level here is the magnet, but the point of this level is to get a bunch of important items, and so that 
doesn't really help. It's like we could just do this. And now we're in this other place. The Skyways with the disco tech. Um, yeah, but we're, we're completely not gonna make it through this level without the items in that previous level. Oh yeah, you can find the Frogger portion of the game though. I probably shouldn't do that with the mouse navigation. Um, anyway, let's go back. Oh, not that far back. This'll do. Oh no, that's too far. Okay. I think we're missing a couple of items. Maybe manual saves will be nice once I finally have those. <laughs> oh, not that. Oh, Tuco. Maybe I should wrap up the Let's Play and play with my cat soon. Oh, interesting. Ardoel, who has been the one giving out all the hints, says that Magnet's only necessary if you want to skip this level. Oh yeah, so there's another way out of this, huh? Are you sure? Because I thought, um, I thought the way this level worked was you get a bunch of other things, including the fourth robot, and then you come right back here. I thought you still need the magnet for that, but I'm probably remembering that wrong, since this person in chat seems to know more about the game than I do. Oh, that was the minefield that I just walked into. Yeah, let's not do that. Oh yeah, and then here's another puzzle. There's another floppy disk. I don't think this key works in that lock, does it? Yeah, I need the red key. Oh, I see. Um, so if I do have the fourth robot, then the magnet isn't needed to get through. That's interesting. I don't know why you would skip this level, though, because you can't really complete this level, or you can't complete the next one without the fourth robot, right? Okay, so this is like a practice maze for the minefield. This is the entrance to the ventilation shafts. Another documentation disc. You go getting into everything. All right. 
right, here's the computer terminal where we can read those disks. Computer room. So this is this is a map. The map ante room. The minefield map. Force field tunnel. There's the master computer in the middle. The four buttons. The minefield. The ventilation shaft. So this is one of the entrances we can get to. Whoa. Oh, I have not tried the mouse input in this mode before. Where is the player? Okay, let's let's not do that. Let's use the keyboard. So one button we can get to from this ventilation shaft. Oh gosh. So library, ventilation shaft, down. Left, down, what? Oh gosh, this is very non-Euclidean. filled up the keyboard buffer and why would it take so long for the keyboard buffer to empty? Is it actually just legitimately taking a while to run this code maybe? Yeah, I don't know. None of the game code has been taking much time to run, but it's possible some of the sound effects are actually pretty CPU hungry. See, this is like if you try to follow, oh, I should really not use the mouse here. Oh yeah, high voltage room, safety room. Okay, that's the elevator. That's the, oh, trash dump. Right, this is where stuff ends up if you leave it in the hallway. Tunnel bypass, force field tunnel. So you can start to see how there are different like booby-trapped paths leading into the central room that unlocks the master computer. Um, so there's the force field tunnel, there's the high voltage room. So what is that? Is that a button that you have to hit, I think? I can't tell if that's something you're supposed to hit or something you're supposed to avoid. <laughs> hmm. left is the minefield, and up is the ventilation shafts, oh, and that's, so there are all these loops you can get into with the ventilation shaft, like I was trying to figure out, okay, what happens if you go in that first shaft, I think it's an infinite loop, so you go around here, then down, and then you come out the second one on the top, okay, what about the second one, then you go down, oh, now you're on that side, now you come out the third one on the top, um, the third one on the bottom, that comes out either of those two on the top. 
So yeah, there's a lot of these that you want to avoid. Um, so this little loop where we go over and then down and then back is where we get out. So that would be the fourth shaft on the bottom. We could use that counter chip. <laughs> If we send the ro if we send a robot off to do that, then I don't think we can follow. I think the robot just has to stay on that button until we can come up with another way of getting over there. So maybe that's not the first one to do. So the two on the right, I think humans can like I think your player does that. Like I think normally robots don't go through openings that are one block wide because um, that'll set off the bumper. I think typically this game uses those one block wide openings as areas where, you know, it's like this is for humans and not robots. So maybe we do those two first and then we have to do the two on the left and like lose a robot temporarily each time. Um. Oh, Aradil says that the blue key should work in this. I was just messing up the placement. Oh, okay. Thanks for the clarification. And then that, that thing in the high voltage room is, a, is indeed a button to push. Cool, so let's do either the high voltage room or the force field tunnel first. Um, I think when you're actually in here, there's a, oh, I see. So this thing on the right side is the entrance. Um, Does it open the bypass? Let's take a look at that. Also, let's just take, like, leave the discs here and look at the discs. Uh, also, can it, do we auto-save when we're in the map? We do. Really don't want to move the mouse right now. Yeah, you can totally save the game while you're viewing the map, and it seems to work. Some of these little discs use um, like a secondary main loop, and I have it set up so that the saves are disabled when you're not in the game, in the level's regular main loop. But I think the discs are more like a different rendering mode for the actual gameplay. Or that the map disc, rather. Okay. So minefield. The walls in the map room are in the same position as the walls in the minefield. Mines are set off when a robot thrusts against them for more than an instant. Additional mines keep out non-robots. Robot communication is helpful. So yeah, I think the idea is that you can send a robot into the map and into the actual minefield, and then you can communicate the wall positions before the actual mine hits the robot. Force field tunnel, robot relays, pass key items along. Oh, plan ahead for the return journey. Oh, maybe we have to do that one first. Hmm. I know I've done these puzzles, it's just been so long since I have. Ventilation shaft, it's like, yeah, counting chips. Counting chips are the way. Master Computer. The Master Computer controls many of the features of Robotropolis. Use the cameras to monitor robot progress. The computer can be turned off and the robot released by pressing the four buttons. Is that all the discs we have? I thought there might be another disc somewhere. I forget how many discs there are total. Anyway, let's go. So 
we can get in the ventilation shaft that way. I think we want to check out the force field tunnel. Oh, Ardell says if I do the relay last, I don't have to do the return trip. Hmm. Yeah, maybe. So how does this work? Ah. Oh, I have to hold this in the lock. Now I can go down the bypass. And I think this would open that, but I can't. Oh, I see. So the robots have to pass me the key. And are these different colors because the different robots can only pass across them? Okay, well maybe I will take this hint that uh, I can do this later and avoid the return trip and maybe we'll start with the high voltage room. That was on the bottom. That's the garbage room. I think we just want to use the button sensor. This one seems like it might be the easiest. Like, let's modify our circuit from checkers. All these robots are getting really low on the battery power too. Um, let's put one crystal here so that when scanner's battery runs out, it'll automatically recharge. And I'll put the other one in checkers. So we were having that problem before where when you switch rooms, both directions can light up. I wonder if that's going to be a problem again here. Um, what is the quickest way to get back to the map room from here? Is it this one? Oh no, that was the minefield. Elevator lobby. Third on the left, I guess. Oh, and that's where the crystal charger is hanging out, too. Yeah, we can just go up and then activate the button sensor when we, uh, uh, when we hit the top wall, maybe. Could potentially even use these little things on the left edge, but, oops, keep that here.
Okay, so we're allowing that top thruster only when we're in that second state, once we've hit the top wall. And when we're in the first state, we're um, always hitting the bottom thruster. That's what the OR does. I think that'll do what we want. Let's hold this robot. Reset it. And let it go. <laughs> See you later, robot. Any luck? Hmm. Let's turn off the remote and see what's going on. Okay, I don't know. I don't know why I was getting such sporadic output from the sensors, but it seems like that worked. I just had to be patient. I, I'm gonna try backing up to an autosave and doing that entirely from the um, the camera. Let's turn off the power and watch it from the other room. Oh, is it only occasionally a button? Oh, it's like it opens and closes or something. Weird. So I have to inch toward it when it's a button. So like if I had a latching circuit that would remember that direction, that would, it would get there faster. Yeah, maybe that's the way to do it. Um, I mean, that worked. I don't think I need to redo it just for completeness, I guess, but maybe the better solution for that would be to use flip-flops so that it latches to one direction or the other. And then the robot's kind of always moving. I, I worry that it wouldn't actually stay still once. Like maybe I would need some other way to get it to stay still. Anyway, let's go retrieve our robot. I think that worked. Yeah. Cool. All right, that button is pressed. I think it'll just stay pressed. Okay, well now we've got a, I guess we could do the rest of these in various orders, but yeah, maybe we'll get the, the two left ones taken care of. Uh, let's do the ventilation shaft puzzle, maybe. Well, no, the minefield one's definitely gonna, oh, speaking of minefield, uh, the minefield puzzle is definitely going to require two robots. So let's try, uh, maybe we should do the minefield next. 
All right, let's look at the specifics of that in the library. Okay, so we've got an entrance to the minefield. There's one, two, two minefield rooms, and then the master computer room. And so the map looks like what? Okay, so the map ante room comes in at the same position. Then we have two minefield rooms and then these lower rooms. So one thing we could do to test this particular puzzle is to just have two robots running the minefield map. One is the transmitter and one is the receiver. And then just set the transmitter a little bit ahead of the receiver um, so that we get some advance warning. And then just see if the receiver can walk the map without hitting any walls. Um, so imagining what kind of signals we might transmit. And it seems like... Um, it seems like maybe the antenna could do two things. Maybe it could, when the antenna is on, it could halt the robot from moving forward and have it move up or down instead. And maybe when it's, when you turn on the antenna, it could toggle whether you're going up or whether you're going down. So what if that would cause that would cause the robot to kind of weave up and down, avoiding the walls? So it would maybe go up and then down, and then it would hit that thing. And go up, and then it would go through, and then it would end up going down if we toggle, and then through, and then up. Through, and then it would go down again, which is a problem. So if we start out going down, so if we start out going down, as in like the first wall that we slide against is going down. So we go down, then through, up. Ooh, and then there's this problem where we would hit against the bottom wall again. Mm. Let's just go over there. Hmm. Oh yeah, another hint from Aridol who says to consider the color requirements of the other puzzles before I get my robot stuck. Hmm. This is why I kind of wanted to do that key puzzle first, because it seems to require specific robot colors. So is the deal with the red that um, any robot except for red can go through? Yeah, red seems like it can't go through. 
So it seems like checkers could maybe do that whole puzzle. The right white robot. Let's get the key and look at the other side of it too. Oh no, it's got white lines too. I don't understand how you could solve, save this one for last unless you're also returning the robots from the other two puzzles. Which I could do, but it seems like it's easier not to, and just to do the return trip on this one. Oh, never mind. I'm getting this backwards. So, that, like, again, the, the lines don't allow that robot. They prevent that robot. So as long as I have two different colors, then... I can get through all the different kinds of force fields. Like those pairs of lines mean I can't just hand off the um, the key across across there. It's like I could have I could have the blue robot bring it up to that blue line, but I couldn't leave it anywhere the other robots could get to. I'd have to. Let's see. And I can only put robots on the left and right here. Alright, I guess I just have to put, um, cause like, I can't, I don't think I can do anything with, with Sparky. So I've got to put, um, I've got to put the blue robot scanner on this side. And then, and then the white robot checkers on this side and they have to meet like right here. I don't think any other combination works. And so if I use Sparky for any of the other puzzles, um, I could leave him in one puzzle, but I can't, I can't like leave two robots before coming back here. Okay, and what about the return trip? <laughs> Aradel says they've done it in both orders. It just comes down to which puzzle you want to cheese. Yeah, yeah, true enough. I'm also just going through the, think the thinking of like, oh, should I start this right now or should I wrap up the stream and start this on a different stream? Oh, what does this cup of coffee say? Oh, and Tuco's hanging out right behind me. Well, let's see how far we can get into this one.
Okay, so checkers would have to start here. Grab the key from this lock. Where, where do I want to be when all this is happening? And where does this actually have to go? I mean, the robots are not going to be able to put the key in the lock on their own. That's just, like, not going to happen. And this passage is also too small, so, like, I need to be on this side. Um, the robot needs to take the key out of the lock, which it can do. So checkers would start, like, right here. And it would actually pick up the key from the lock. And... So as soon as I press the remote, this could start. Checkers could pick up the key. As soon as the key's in the grabber, he could go this way. And then checkers would stop at the, at the white, um, the first white line over here. Mm, and then how would I know? I could use, um, I could bring some other item and use another item sensor to find out when I'm in this room and have checkers drop the key when he's in this room. Because there's nothing bumper-wise that I think would work, really. What kind of items and item sensors do I have? Crystal? Exit ticket, <laughs> key. So, do I have any dead crystals? I don't think I do. Let's take this one and scanner and use it. Oh, my batteries are so low. Oh, that's a good question. Temp is asking if I can use a bot in a bot. Um, yeah, bots work inside of other bots, but they're not especially useful. And if you try to have one bot exit a robot that it's in, um, it, it can't do that. It'll just wrap around inside. But that's a good question. Controlling whether I'm going left or right, I think. So I'm gonna grab the key. I think I can grab it immediately like that. Does that work? Let's try that again, but with the thrusters on. Hmm. Okay, so something like that.
right, so that'll drop it once we get to the room with the crystal. And then it'll just keep thrusting against that, um, against the force field until we swap it into its other mode. Um, how should the other mode work? Um, I mean, we can pick up the crystal, which will cause the robot to start grabbing things again. Um, and then we could use the antenna to swap the mode here. Anyway, I, we need to think about the return trip in a separate step. Let's, let's go to thinking about the next robot. So this one crosses over that way. Um, scanner's got to be on the other end of that. This could be a key-seeking robot. I mean, once this has the key, it just needs to bring it to me. I think. So it drops the key here. So let's say um, my white robot checkers brings it into the right side of the screen, drops it because there's a crystal. This could end badly if the robot is on in that room where there's a crystal, but the key, like imagine the robot just barely makes it into that room and it lets go, but the key is still in this room, so the key sensor wouldn't actually be able to see it. I think I should just not use the key directional sensor necessarily and maybe just line up the robot so that it moves in that direction and then grabs the key and then moves back. I want the other robot too. I don't think I need this this robot. I'll keep it handy, I guess. Um, what exact position do I want that in? This is like the second block from the top of the room. So this would just grab the thing, grab the key, and then as soon as it's actually grabbed it, it would bring it back. Like, and then I would have to unwire it to get the key out. Um, but what actually needs to happen after that? Like, I would grab the key, put it in that lock. What, what would actually happen? I think that unlocks the, the middle room, and I could go in there, push the button, come back out, But then, I mean, we can try it and like just, but I think I'm gonna get stuck. Um, like if I put a key in that keyway here, it'll open the middle thing, but I would still expect that, um, how do I get a key back into that thing? Like I thought we established that robots were not dexterous enough to put a key in a lock. I 
I want to see what this does so far, just because I, I don't actually know how that lock is going to behave, but I'm pretty sure I'm just, just going to get stuck. Let's make sure this robot's turned on. Let's turn on to this turn on this robot, but hold it to give it a to give the other one a head start. No. Why didn't you bring the key? <sighs> okay, well, let's try that again. Does the grabber have to be slightly further down? Let's see. I can always do a quick save manually. Yeah, why doesn't that work? Robot just need to be further in there. Well, that worked. Okay. You didn't bring the key. Why? <laughs> okay, I mean, I can start and stop this at any time with the remote, so I might as well watch it from over here. So it just closed the door on me, which is cool. But now I've got that. Um, this other robot's gonna be off because of the thruster switch. Oh no, did the key get stuck there because the key is blue? What? No, the key made it through the blue force fields, but it didn't cross rooms. Oh, no, never mind. This is all working as expected. This is just the thing I said it would do where it dropped. Um, so the white robot checkers dropped the key as soon as it saw that this crystal was in the same room, but it dropped it on the other room because that's where the grabber was. So I think we're fine. Let's just move this robot up here, turn it on, and then I think we can grab the key. I think it got, the, the key got dropped a little bit too high for the robot to grab it. Let's move it up a little bit. Hmm. Did I mess up the return thruster somehow? Oh, I did. That's better. So what is this? Now I get to find out what this keyhole actually does. Probably not enough. are so hard to align in this game. There we go. It's 
So it opened that. I don't think it opened anything over here. Let's just check though. No. Yeah, so then you can press that button and it stays pressed. I am pretty sure that the next step in this puzzle involves having the robot put the key back in the lock. And I don't even know if that's possible. I would almost believe it isn't possible, except that we have someone in the chat saying, saying that they've done it this way before. So that's kind of neat. Um, I think it might be a good stopping point, though, to save this puzzle for another time. Let's find the closest autosave where we aren't screwed and save that. Still going backwards. Oh geez, is that my whole browser history? No, no, there's plenty of browser history. Okay. Um, it just ran out of stuff in the back button for some reason. I know the game needs its own like save UI. Like I like the URLs for sharing, but um, I'm also definitely gonna have like a save UI with thumbnails and history and stuff. Yeah, this is before we actually moved any of the robots across, right? Okay, I think this is a safe place to save. White robot is fine. Trying to go in there. Okay. Sparky is cool. Okay. Cause like, okay, so I need I need a robot to put this key right there. Wow, that's gonna be tricky. Or I could do the puzzles in a different order and avoid doing that. So, okay. I think this is a good place to save. I'm just hit save there. Um, and maybe, actually, let's make this today's Let's Play save game. So this is the native save format, this GSV. Um, it should still be compatible with the original DOS version of the game. Um, looks like that. It has the same data as this URL just after or before compression. So I think that's it for today. I hope that was interesting. It's uh, a bit of a let's play, a bit of a how does it work. Um, if this game is interesting at all to you, I think I advise you to try it. I think it might be a, a fun experience. It might be too retro for some people, like if you're expecting something that has fewer dead ends and more explanation and nicer graphics, then this game is a bit in the like kind of old school Nintendo hard sort of category. But if you don't mind that, or if you for some reason even like that, then um, it's a pretty cool way to uh, learn about digital logic while playing with robots. And in case anyone else wants to start from this particular save game, I'll uh, just put this URL in uh, the Scanlam Live uh, 
Twitter box again. Alright, and it is long, but it should still tweet because the URL shortener allows 4 kilobytes. <laughs> And it will look like it will look like this in your Twitter box, and then you can click it, and it spins for a second and loads. So yeah. Well, I will see you all next time. Thanks for stopping by, and uh, yeah, special thanks to everyone who keeps the channel going by sending in hardware, by sharing it with your friends, by supporting on Patreon. Um, I'll try to do well by uh, all of your. Uh, desires and everything that you um, have already kind of invested in by uh, spending time and sending a couple bucks my way and all that. So I'll try to keep this going and I'll see you all next time. And Tuco will keep the, uh, keep the chair warm. <laughs> see you later.